In this video, we're making a full table of desert terrain. What's up guys and welcome back to Eric's Hobby Workshop. In this video, I'm going to take you through everything you need to get yourself started for 9th edition and to have a full table that you can have some awesome battles on. There are new terrain rules in 9th edition and terrain is more important than ever and everybody needs a full table. So in this video, we're going to build a battle mat, we're going to build some awesome rock formations that are going to look absolutely killer on there, and we're going to build a few little other things that uh, will use some of the new 9th edition terrain keywords. So let's get to it. Let's start by making our battle mat. We're going to start with a polybagged canvas drop cloth, dimensions 4 feet by 15 feet. Or hang on a second, actual size 3 foot 9 by 14 foot 9? It's hard for me to understate how much this annoyed me. Why not just put the actual dimensions on the package? You know, a, a Warhammer board is four feet wide. That's why I bought the four foot version. I didn't read the small print until... Anyways, it's not too important. I'm just gonna take all that negative energy, compress it into a little ball. Whew, I don't need it. Let's keep going. Let's move on with our poly backed cloth. As you can see, the reason we're using this one is it's got this plasticky material on the back of one side of it and the canvas on the other which means it'll grab the mixture that we're gonna place on it really well, but it won't bleed all the way through, which is good for keeping things nice and neat. So I measure that out to as close to six by four as I can, and I tape it onto the ground with some duct tape. I only did two sides so I could get right up to the edges on the long edges. Next, I'm gonna take some acrylic plastic caulking, and this stuff is the paintable version, and you can get this stuff at any Home Depot. So using my caulking gun, I squeeze out two full tubes of that into a plastic container. And then I add a little bit of brown paint to tinge it to a more deserty color. I use a little bit of isopropyl alcohol as that will thin the mixture and make it a little bit easier to stir. You can see I'm adding some brown and yellow and red paint in an unspecified ratio. I guess my intention was, was to make it a completely unreplicable color but then I add a little bit of Tatooine's Finest and keep blending it. Adding the sand gives it this nice coarse texture that's gonna give us a lot of detail as we proceed with the project. So using a plastic shovel and a drywall scraper, I spread this stuff out all over the mat. You can control it pretty well, so I actually didn't even get any off the mat, which was pretty neat. But what I quickly realized was that I hadn't made nearly enough of the mixture and I kind of only had enough for half of the mat. Which means I had to go back to Home Depot and buy some more of the stuff. I also noticed this here. I had laid my mat down on this crack in the concrete in my courtyard area here and you can see there's a bit of a line carrying on through my mat. Live and learn. Now this technique is based on a technique I first saw done by Mel the Terrain Tutor, who's an absolute legend in the hobby space. Uh, hasn't been posting so much tutorial stuff recently, but go check him out if you haven't seen his stuff. He's got a big library of awesome tips and tricks. There's also a great video by RFD Hobby that came out recently where he makes a city board using this, this same technique and I use that a little bit for reference as well. One thing that I did differently from both Mel the Terrain Tutor and RFD Hobby is I did a much bigger mat so I wasn't able to do it on a desk. Another difference, another key difference is that I used a much coarser stone and what this means if you do this is two things. One, it's going to be heavier. And the other is it's going to use a lot more caulk and the two, a lot more caulking. And the two are related. Because of the size of the grit that I use, the individual stones, when you're scraping across the top of the scraper tool, the minimum clearance for how thin you can get it is going to be your biggest stone. So even though I was picking out some pebbles here and there, I foolishly used some huge tough aggregate, which gave me a cool modeled texture, but it's a trade-off because the gains you make in texture, you have to use more caulking, it gains in weight, and that can cause its problems of its own. 
So anyways, I've got more caulking here and we are making a much bigger batch this time. This time I actually roped my wife into helping me as I try to match the color here. Like I said, if you want to match your color between batches, then maybe keep track of the paints you use. As you can see, I'm using inks, I'm using paints, and I'm just mixing it up all like crazy. I don't think it's super important to have a uniform color or I would have paid more attention to that, but that's neither here nor there. I'm mixing up a nice big batch. The other thing to note is that it dries a little bit more vividly. So you can see me and my lovely wife here putting it on the mat and it's a much paler color, but the previous batch was like that as well and it'll dry a much more similar color to what we already have on the mat. So don't worry about that weird pate sort of color. It will get a little bit more vibrant as it dries. As you can see, I'm wearing a pair of rubber gloves and I'm just using my hands to smooth it out a little bit. You don't want it to be too thick, but you also don't want it to be too thin. On this side, you can see there's still a little bit of a threadbare appearance where you can see the canvas through it. Compared with on the other side here, where it is nice and opaque. I guess that means I'm headed back to the store once again. And this time I'm going to resolve to get as much caulking as I think I'm going to need. That should do it. All right, one final batch, let's go. This stuff looks like a nice, lovely marshmallow appearance on camera, but believe me, in person, it smells rather bad and is not as appetizing as it looks upon playback. As you can see, I'm adding my last layer of caulking and I try to add a little bit to each side in case the color's not matched. I add some patchy bits just so the two sides blend together with each other. And there you go. When it's finished, you can see that there is a little bit of variation in color, but I actually kind of like it. Pretty good. So I let that dry a little bit. And, oh, it's behaving pretty nicely. Let's see how it rolls up. Rolls up nicely, unrolls nicely as well. Let's make some rock formations. So my inspiration for these rock formations was the Wadi Rum Desert in Jordan. It has these gorgeous high rock faces coming out of a red desert and it's just an absolutely breathtaking landscape. It's really helpful to have a few reference pictures when you work because that'll give you a bit of a guidance. I'm basically just using XPS foam here, one inch as you can see, and then with a bit of Gorilla Glue, I glue the stuff together. This stuff comes in a tube that's also available at Home Depot or your hardware store, but I'll put a link in the description below for something like this as well. This stuff bonds really, really nicely. There's no need to reinforce anything. And then as you can see, I'm just using a little bit of isopropyl alcohol to mop up my desk while it's still wet. And it cleans up pretty nice and easily. Next, to make a sedimentary rock appearance, I cut hundreds of horizontal slices into the foam. This is gonna simulate the strata of the rocks, the individual layers of sediment that have pressed together over the millennia. And and then I start ripping and tearing with the edge of my knife, pulling away layers here and there to get that nice rocky shape. I also use the retracted blade to just sort of rip away at the already cut pieces and when the foam naturally pulls apart, it does so with a bit of a stratified appearance and you get a nice kind of rough, organic, random sedimentary texture. All right guys, what you're about to see is Bad safety practice 101. Let me state this as clearly as possible. Do not cut towards yourself. I knew this, everybody knows this, but watch what I do here in slow motion. The slow motion makes that scream seem a lot more dignified, but it was more of like, ah, ah. it was more of like a sheep bleeding when it's played in full speed. Not my finest hour, guys. Don't worry, it wasn't that bad. It was a pretty deep cut, but it's healing up nicely. As you can see, I'm not even wearing a band-aid anymore. That was a, a little bit ago at the time of filming this. But uh, yeah, guys, be safe. Be safe when you're working on this much terrain sometimes you just get casual you get sloppy after a million cuts you think oh i got this i'm fine i'm invincible you're not okay just stay vigilant 
stay safe. So I bandaged up my thumb and I kept going. This time, reducing the speed and keeping my hand on a different level from where I'm cutting. And I had no more accidents. Next I mix a little bit of spackle with some brown paint. And the reason I do this is so I can cover the rocks and unify the layers together. And also if it chips, it'll be brown on the inside instead of white like normal spackle. You can also see here, the thickness of the spackle allows me to add a bit of a horizontal sedimentary texture using the impasto. And you can see when I brush my brush horizontally, it leaves these subtle lines. They're gonna be too subtle to even be seen later, but I thought that was neat. This piece here that I'm working on is a nice natural stone arch, which is gonna be a spectacular piece on the battlefield, as well as offering a great firing platform or raised area. It's quite satisfying to see this brown color come together on it, because the pink color, it's really hard for me to suspend my disbelief and picture it as a terrain piece, but once you start getting the brown on there, it gets exciting. This piece is gonna be a little different. This is gonna be sort of an area where the sand has blown up in sort of a dune around some low rocky outcroppings. This is a piece that in ninth edition could be difficult ground, as well as also something that's defensible and breachable. So something that your troop types can walk through, but vehicles can't, and would be an impediment to movement and also a position that'll provide some cover. Varying your pieces like this not only make the game more interesting, but they make it more visually interesting as well. So I'm using some bark chips here, which I don't use much of in this project, but they're also a great way to get sedimentary stone texture. If you want to see more about this, check out my video on my Wasteland Desert Fort, which I will link here. This was an interesting experiment here. I noticed in some of my reference pictures there are areas where desert sand has blown up against the rocky outcroppings. I made a decision not to put these outcroppings on bases just to minimize their footprint and also make them easier to store. But I did want to get some of the effect of the crumbling rock falling off of the rock as well as sand blown up against it in sort of like, almost like drifts. I was about to say snow drifts. I mean, in Canada, we have a lot more snow drifts than we have sand dunes. So that's where my mind is at. Uh, I mixed up a little bit more of my caulking and sand and paint blend and covered it on my dune areas so they would match the battle map. It's just like icing a cake. I think about food a lot when I'm doing terrain. That's kind of interesting. Do not eat, by the way, for all my viewers. What I'm doing here is I have a paper towel with alcohol on it and I'm patting down and then I'm applying the same mixture to my dune. It ends up just kind of looking like this weird panzerotti or cookie or something like that. So I'm not sure that was successful, but you gotta try. Here I'm adding a brown wash to some of my stone areas on my dune piece because I wasn't convinced that the color was exactly the way I wanted it. I did a lot of tweaking with the color on this project. It's kind of hard to hone in on what exactly I wanted. I knew I wanted a dark rock and a reddish sand to give the impression of a red desert, but it was kind of tricky to get the effect just right. So at this stage I was looking at the color of the rocks and I was thinking that maybe I needed to go a different direction. There's an interesting thing about miniatures and the way they react with light compared with real world objects. In the real world, in a desert, a rocky landscape will be lit from the direction of the sun and to a much lesser extent, a small amount of reflected light from the sand. Um, but you get that harsh sunlight, you get those deep shadows a lot of the time. And this does not necessarily come across in the same way on a tabletop setting. Like for example, in my living room, which is where I'm gonna be using these pieces, there is uh, big windows with natural light coming in from the side. There's an overhead lighting fixture and there's white walls that reflect light as well. And you don't get the same depth of shadows and the same harsh lit look and the same orangey sunlight highlights that I wanted to get on this rock unless you punch it up a little bit with the paint. So I decided to come back in from a very dark base coat and rip this up again 
starting dark and coming light with successive dry brushes to simulate the lighting effect that I wanted to do. And this is very similar to how a miniature is painted. You know, in, in real life, if a man's shirt is blue, it's, you know, that's just what it is. But if you're trying to paint a blue shirt on a miniature, you're gonna do a dark blue on the underarm and the armpits, and you're gonna do some highlights on the top. It's the same concept here. You have to simulate the lighting environment that you're trying to suggest. And then as a final step, I'm gonna do a light dry brush all over my mat, very subtle, but just to pick up some of the raised areas to give a little bit of variation. And then let's set up the table all together and see how it looks. All right, you guys, I hope you liked that video. Please let me know what you thought down in the comments below. Uh, if you're not already subscribed, subscribe, hit that old notification bell. You can get in here early when the comments are fresh, right? Seize it. And uh, check out my Patreon, check out the Amazon links in the description below. And there's lots of cool stuff coming, guys. It's a great time to be alive. We're October starting, we're doing some spooky stuff, we're doing some orky stuff, you know? It's gonna be great. We'll see you next time on Eric's Hobby Workshop.